Hallelujah. Well, I welcome you again. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. I, um, my husband likes to refer to Easter as the Super Bowl of the Christian faith. And I would agree. If you get excited about the Super Bowl, I hope you get excited about Easter. Amen? Because Super Bowl's for now. Easter's for eternity. Put the stand down, he says. Hallelujah. Okay. Now, just to reintroduce myself, I am Pastor Debbie Moylan. I have the honor and privilege of leading uh, this band of followers of Christ. People that have decided to uh, be fools for Christ, which is the, the, the title of my message today, Fools for Christ. You know, it's not every time that you get to celebrate Easter on April Fool's Day, amen? And I believe that uh, Jesus Christ had the greatest April Fool's joke ever. That Friday they were believed, he was believed to be dead, but on Sunday, April Fool's. Amen, amen? The resurrection story is an incredible story. And we are fools for Christ because, honestly, there is more to the story. This crazy Easter story really only has value if it makes a difference in our lives, if we are truly changed from the top to the bottom of who we are, if we are truly different. Otherwise, it's just a good story. It's something to tell your kids at night when they go to sleep. It's something to enact on a Sunday morning, to put on costumes and... and, and, and entertain the masses because boy isn't it a great story it's a great story right but that's if we believe that the bible is a collection of stories that mean nothing that have no value that are antiquated and don't really mean anything in our lives but the reality is is that the truth of the resurrection has power it has power to change even the most wretched sinner so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you, O oh God, that we have today. <laughs> this truly is a day that you have made, and I will rejoice and be glad in it. Because, God, the day that you ascended, God, my sins were wiped clean. And those in this room, their sins were wiped clean. And that we celebrate that today. And that we can be fools for Christ, crazy, passionate followers of you. And so I pray, God, that this word take root today in the hearts and the minds of the people that hear it in Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. Amen. Hey, there's a guy on late night TV called Stephen Colbert. Does anybody know who he is? Uh, and he has a, a show. He used to do this show called The, the Colbert Rapport. And uh, if you enjoyed watching, the guy's a funny guy. And he recently did an interview, eh, recent, maybe a couple years ago, and he described this persona he created in this Colbert Report as a pundit, uh, someone who's blissfully unaware of important facts, but confident in the rightness of his feelings. <laughs> uh, Colbert's creative persona acted on whatever he felt to be true. He was well-intentioned, but poorly informed. And the humor came from his willingness to play the fool, really, for nine years on this show, to, to mine the depths of stupidity in search for the unexpected, which might evoke laughter for those that watch the show. And according to Stephen Colbert, idiocy is when your good intentions and feelings overwhelm your judgment to the point you dismiss facts that might challenge your beliefs. Impervious to reason, his alter ego is a fool because he doesn't act according to logic and social norms or expectations. And so in the middle of the interview, the interviewer right then shifts the conversation uh, because Stephen Colbert is known to be um, a practicing Catholic. He is a believer. And so the, 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 um, the interviewer says, well, what does it mean to be a fool for Christ? And then Colbert defines foolishness for Christ as this, the willingness to be wrong in society, or wrong according to our time, but right according to our, our conscience, as guided by the Holy Spirit. Now that's some good truth right there, right? That's a pretty good definition. I'm going to repeat it. It's a willingness to be wrong in society, or wrong according to our time, 
but right according to our conscience as guided by the Holy Spirit. Now, it's kind of critical that he added that as guided by the Holy Spirit, amen? Because we can be guided by our conscience, can be, can be directed by all kinds of things, and not necessarily guided by the Holy Spirit. So we have to make sure that we are following our conscience as dictated by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, we would be in a world of mess. Can I get an amen for that? Now, to be guided by the Holy Spirit, now that's key. Now, you might be expecting me to read an Easter story, but you know what? The kids did such an awesome job of telling you what the true Easter story was, right? How Jesus was put in a tomb on, on Friday afternoon, and when they came on Sunday morning, the stone was rolled away, and this amazing story begins that we are inheritors of in this very day and age. This morning, we celebrate that thing that happened 2,000 years ago. Why? Because it was a great story? No, because it means something. And, and so I want to read a scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 9 through 13. And here's the thing. This is Paul writing to a dysfunctional church. Okay? So take that in mind as you hear these words. But if you want to read along from me first, with me, 1 Corinthians 4, verse 9 through 13. And he says this. I sometimes think God has put us apostles on display. Like prisoners of war at the end of a victor's parade, condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the entire world, to people and angels alike. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools. Say fools. Fools. But you claim to be so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so powerful. You are honored, but we are ridiculed. Even now, we go hungry and thirsty, and we don't have enough clothes to keep warm. We are often beaten and have no home. We work wearily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us, yet we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash right up to the present moment. And that's Paul's experience as a follower of Christ. So here's the thing. The gospel, this crazy Easter story, the truth of Jesus' resurrection from the dead and what that means, this gospel story is either going to enrage you or engage you. It's either going to enrage you and come up against everything you believe, or it's going to engage you and capture you and get a hold of you. Now, if you're Paul, originally Saul, and then later known as the Apostle Paul, it basically became both, right? First, his story truly enraged him, so much that he went forward and began to kill Christians, dragging them out of their homes and putting them to death, asking for permission to go into other cities to do the same. But then in doing so, right, then he became engaged, because he had this radical encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. And it transformed his life so much that he wrote the majority of the New Testament. He truly became engaged with the gospel so that it's, he sacrificed everything. Can you say everything? Everything. Good, you're with me. So let's take a look at this passage and learn what it means to truly be a fool for Christ. Anybody here even considering the idea of maybe I want to be a fool for Christ. Come on, anybody? All right, we have one. One's good. We can start with one. Whew, because honestly, Paul was one. Come on now. Paul was one. Paul was a powerful one. If you truly become a fool for Christ, well, this Easter story, like I said, will either enrage you or engage you. So here's number one. The first thing is, as a fool for Christ, you are on display. Can you say on display? On display, all right? I'm going to repeat the first verse. He says, I sometimes think God has put us to apostles on display, like prisoners of war at the end of a victor's parade, condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the entire world, to people and angels alike. This, this brings up this image of this Roman general, this parade, this victor coming in from battle and trotting on all the people, these prisoners of war behind. This is the analogy that Paul is drawing. This is what I feel like, humiliated, dragged in in front of people to be a spectacle. 
where he talks about the gladiators, the fighting in the arena, and how they were using all the Christians to fight in the arena. And he says, sometimes I feel like this, that we're put on display like a slave. Lowest of the low, jeered, harassed, the butt of jokes as you trotted through the community. So here's the truth, folks. Your Christianity might be on display. Others might mock or jeer. Hey, now, they might even question your decisions, right? Has anybody ever happened to this? Hey, what do you mean you're not coming to Johnny's birthday party Sunday morning at 11? What do you mean you don't want to get drunk with your friends anymore? What do you mean you're not finagling your taxes a little bit so you don't have to quite pay what you actually owe? What do you mean? What do you mean? What do you mean? What are these changes that I'm seeing in your life? How come the things that you are doing are completely different than what I know you to be? You know what? After... Over 20 years of being saved, I have these questions even now. I have some good friends that I've known for a long time that knew me when. Can I get an amen? Okay? Knew me when? <laughs> In the 80s and the 90s. But my testimony remains the same. All right? I have changed by the gospel story. Anybody here changed by the gospel story? Amen. Hallelujah. So, hey, you know what? I don't want to do tequila shots anymore. Shocker, okay? Used to be something. I used to refer to that as mother's milk. Do you know that? I used to refer to tequila as mother's milk. That's really, really scary. And I have friends now that don't understand why I don't want to do tequila shots. Come on, Debbie. Come on, I bought the best tequila ever. No, thank you. No, thank you. Because I've been engaged. I've been engaged by this gospel story. There's nothing in this world that can imitate the reality of the presence of God in my life. Nothing. Nothing. Say nothing. 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 There is nothing that is going to get a hold of you like God and the presence of God. There is nothing that is going to fulfill you like the presence of the Holy Spirit in your life. It might look attractive, these other things, but the truth of the matter is, is nothing. There's nothing like the presence of God. Number two, it might seem like others are winning, and you are not. It might seem like others are winning, and you are not. Right? And Paul goes on to say, we are weak, but you are so powerful. You are honored, but we are ridiculed. In the midst of the storm, sometimes we can begin to question, why me? Why me? Or the other side of the coin of that is, why not them? Why not them? Look how they live. Why aren't they going through these things? I'm trying to do all the right things. What's going on? Why me? Why me? Or the classic, why do bad things happen to good people? Do you know that everybody has those same questions at some point in their lives? And the fact of the matter is, it sometimes seems like others are winning. Why do bad things happen to good people? I want to draw your attention to this perfect man, Jesus. Right? Scripture tells us he was a man familiar with suffering, a man of sorrows. So if Jesus suffered, why do we expect less? But his suffering yielded a greater victory. What you endure, what you persevere through, is yielding a greater victory. Can I tell you that right now? What you are going through right now, whatever you might be confronting right now, is yielding a greater victory in your life. No matter what you may be going through in preparation, it's yielding a greater victory. You guys are a greater victory. You too, my friend. I know you've been through it. Nate, greater victory. Now you know, I know you're not feeling it right now. Greater victory. Greater victory. All right? This is what comes as we become fools for Christ because we persevere. We persevere. Jesus taught about this very thing. He says, what benefit is there if you gain the whole world and lose your soul? You might be entering after these or going after these things that are very worldly but mean nothing. Right? We want to make sure we're going after the things of God. He also said, seek the kingdom of God above all else and live righteously, and he will give you everything you need. 
All right? Hallelujah. God gives you everything you need as you seek to serve him first. Become a fool for Christ. He gives you everything you need. Don't get caught up in what you see in others' lives, okay? You have no idea what is going on behind closed doors. The grass seems greener in some other people's lawns, but I'm going to tell you, you have no idea what kind of poop is fertilizing that lawn. You have no idea what's going on behind, behind closed doors, so you need to keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the author, perfecter of our faith, and that is what will get you through. He's the one that defeated death, hell, and the grave for you. Amen? So don't be looking to your neighbor. Don't be looking at anybody else's lives. You keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Okay, number three, life is not a bowl of cherries. Look at your neighbor and say, life is not a bowl of cherries. Life is not a bowl of cherries, okay? And Paul goes on to say, even now, we go hungry and thirsty, and we don't have enough clothes to keep warm. We are often beaten and have no home. We work wearily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Yet, we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash right up to the present moment. Now, I, I had the pleasure of watching all the videos of what happened here while I was gone. And, and Neil happened to mention this one thing last week. He said, God doesn't always give you a sweet life. Is that a quote of what you said, my friend? Yes. And he talked about some of you, and he, he looked around the room and talked about you all. Does life always end up going the way you expect? No. You know, the thing about following Christ and being a fool for Christ, it's not a get-out-of-hell-free card. We don't say, you know, Lord, I want to follow you because I, I'm afraid of what eternity is going to yield for me. Because it's so much more than that. It's certainly not a life-will-be-easy card. You don't get a free pass from pain and suffering and loss. But are you willing to take the journey? Knowing that following Christ might cost you everything? It might cost you everything. It certainly cost him everything, amen? Your sins, my sins, cost Jesus everything. But in order to follow him, you have to be willing to be a fool for Christ, a world changer that does not follow the world's rules and expectation. The reality of it is this. Suffering is a common experience for all believers. If you are loyal to Christ and opposed to sin, Satan, and, the, and evil and injustice, guess what? You are going to suffer. There's difficulties. These difficulties that we endure are a means of sharing and identifying with Christ's suffering. Right? We, 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 we pick up our cross daily. And so knowing that, do you have the image of Good Friday and what it was like for Christ to carry that cross to Calvary and how he stumbled and how he fell and how we needed somebody to come alongside and pick it up and bring it along the way? When we know that we have to die to self and pick up our cross daily, it's not easy. There's going to be struggles. But there's a greater victory. Amen? I want to give you three scriptures before I share just a smidge about China. Romans 8, 17. And since we are his children, we are his heirs. You are God's heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we are to share his glory, we must also share in his suffering. Philippians 1.29. For you have been given not only the privilege of trusting in Christ, but also the privilege of suffering for him. Do you know suffering is a privilege? It's a privilege and an honor for the sake of the gospel. Philippians 3.10, he says this, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. We talked about this before, that same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you as a follower of Christ. To be a fool for Christ means that you have resurrection power living inside of you. The ability to be an overcomer, to live in victory because of what Christ has done, lives and dwells in you as a follower of Christ, to experience the resurrection from the dead. This is the hope and the, and the goal of all of us. Last night at 10 o'clock, 
I began to pray for my friends in China. They are 12 hours apart. And I want to, I'm going to show you some pictures <laughs> because of what they sent me last night. What, honey? No, I have my, I have my, um, I just want to show you the group that they sent me last night. Hang on just a sec, guys, sorry. I thought I was prepared. All right. So I'm going to walk around and show you this. So this is the team that I worked with in China. Can you see them? Yes. You know what they did, just like what you guys did. We prepared an Easter story, a passion play. What's up, Justin? You see them? Here's the thing. Can you see him? You see him all? I'll share more, more about this in a few. Hey. Man, you guys look alike. <laughs> see him? So here's the thing. When you want to talk about sacrificing everything, they were willing to do this knowing that it's illegal. They risk everything for the sake of the gospel. I think I had Tom share with you when I was gone, don't take your faith for granted. Don't take this opportunity that you have to follow Christ for granted. Because their church is illegal. The government at any time can come in and arrest them and put them in jail. Some of them would never be here from again. That's just the reality of it. But the importance of the gospel, the importance of their faith is more important than self. It's more important than their lives. It's more important than what they own. They sacrifice everything. Ginger met a woman that was there um, just outside of Shanghai who rents a small room that's probably the size of most of your bathrooms. Fits one bed, maybe a small area to go to the bathroom and a kitchen, but takes every last other dime that she has and rents a space below that so that she can run a preschool for kids and tell them about Jesus. That's what it means to be a fool for Christ. It's sacrificing self for the sake of the gospel because it means something. The Easter story means something. And I know it's, sometimes it, we just look at it, it's like an opportunity, it's a family day, and let's share a meal and, and open up Easter baskets. But the truth of the reality of it is, is that without Easter, what we do here means nothing. My friends in China sacrificed all for the sake of the gospel. So let me ask you this, do you want to know his power? I would say decide today to follow him if you never have. Because either way, you will experience trials in this life. As a follower of Christ, not a follower of Christ, you will experience trials. But wouldn't you rather go through it with him? To be a fool for Christ? To be a world changer? To make a difference? And sacrifice all? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, that you have called us, each and every one by name. And Lord, that you have known us, you knit us together in our mother's womb, you know the very uh, number of hairs on our heads, and that you have created us for a plan and a purpose to glorify your name. And Lord, you have put the desire to worship you and to follow you in our very hearts and minds and souls at the point of conception. And, Lord, that without it, we are lost. And so this day, God, I just pray for these people. I pray for each and every one in this place, God. I first, first I, I pray, God, for those that uh, have never chosen to follow you. And that, Lord, this day, 
They might hear that call, that still small voice calling out and and reaching out and tugging at their heart this morning, knowing that there's more to life than what they have been doing, that there's there's a greater life, a greater victory, a a greater uh, plan and purpose if they would just surrender and follow you. And so, Lord, for those people, God, I pray, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation. And Lord, for all of those people that are, have, might have just grown tired and weary in well-doing, that God, today would be a day of harvest. That they would re- be able to recommit to being a fool for Christ, for, for being willing to sacrifice everything, to set aside self, to be able to serve you. But God, to be sensitive to how you are specifically guiding them and leading them to follow you, It looks different for each and every one, but today, God, I pray, Lord, they're able to say, yes, today, I want to be a fool for you. God, we know that your Holy Spirit draws. And Lord, we just exalt the name of Jesus, Lord, that we are told that if we just exalt the name of Jesus, that you will draw all men and women unto yourself. It's nothing that we do, God. We don't orchestrate anything. We don't manipulate anything. This is not an emotional appeal. But God, the Holy Spirit does the work. And we just allow you to do it. And so God, in this place right now, in the quietness of our hearts, would you just speak to your people? If there's an area that needs to be surrendered, that you would bring that to mind? If there are those that need to begin this journey with you, would you tell them today, God? If there are those, Lord, that need to rise up and and, and to a greater level of service, would you tell them that too, Lord? I know that in any group of people, whether in this room or those watching online, there's bound to be at least one that has never made a commitment to Christ. And so we want to join with you today and to pray with you. If you are feeling led to uh, begin this journey of following Christ, of just seeing what it could be in your life or yield in your life to be a fool for Christ. We want to pray with you. And so I'm going to ask everyone in this place, whether it's your first time or hundredth time or thousandth time, just to pray with me so we can pray together with those that have never done this before. And so if you would repeat after me, Dear Jesus, I thank you for loving me. I thank you for taking my sins upon the cross and giving me new life. I believe in you. I trust you. I seek to follow you this day and all days. Strengthen me and encourage me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Thank you for new life. Today I give you mine. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 If you have uh, never prayed that prayer before and today is your first time, please talk to me after this service today. I have a special gift for you. Um, to help you to begin the journey. We want to come alongside of you. We want to partner with you in this new faith journey. And um, I want to close, we're just going to close with a a quick revamp of happy day. I'd like to pray a blessing over you before we do that. So if you were able to, please stand. It's been four weeks since I've been able to pray a blessing over you, so I look forward to doing it. Please receive this. May you be filled with all of God's fullness and may you have the mind and the heart of Christ. May you be consistent 
in your commitment, when you feel in touch and when you feel out of touch. Walk by faith and not by feeling, resting on his promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Praise God and let God's peace dwell with you today and always. Amen.